Yeah. Okay. The, the thing is, uh, there is no strategy that cover all of them, and that's where they are lost. So of course, there's no law that them. can cover everything. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, do you mind if I move time? Can we take that after? Is it pressing? It can wait. Great. Um, Charles, please. Thank you. Okay. So uh, just a reminder, I'm Charles Eckel, and uh, very excited to uh, and happy to have the opportunity to talk to you about two of my favorite uh, subjects, uh, open source software and uh, internet standards. And the reasons why and potential benefits I see being out there when you combine these two. So let's see. So first of all, you know, why standards? What's the importance there? And I think for those of you who have been in this, uh, in the networking space for a while, you've seen that standards have played a key role in, in, in networking and in the industries associated with it. Really, there's, it's demanded by customers, by industry itself, that if you're a vendor or a solution provider, that you adhere to the standards and that these standards be in place. And the reasons for that are to avoid a vendor lock-in with any one vendor, and also to have that interoperability when you do get equipment from multiple different vendors and multiple different providers, that, that they can actually work together in a, a network of, of heterogeneous equipment. Now, for the most part, um, vendors have participated very well in, in the standards process, have cooperated with their partners and with their competitors to define these standards. And the reasons for that is that for these vendors, that they need to do that in order to make their, their products viable. And they also, in turn, benefit from this interoperability because they know that they need for their equipment to be able to to work with not only their partner's equipment, but also with competitors' equipments when plugged into the same network. So then why, why open source? Well, for open source, the, the, the impact has been, say, more recent. But certainly in the last five years at least, and, and arguably many more years, open source has really come on the scene uh, in the networking space and in the internet uh, to have a, a huge impact. To the point now where open source is actually demanded by the industry and by customers. Uh, when you get a, um, an RFP, a request to uh, make a, a proposal for, for a solution, you, it, you really need to have an open source story in order to even have a seat at the table um, when you're talking to a customer about a solution you want to provide for them for their network. You can see open source being used defensively. And, and what I mean by this is, if you think of an industry where you've been uh, defining standards and seeing a lot of value from those standards, then in order to continue to get the benefit of those standards going forward, it's important to add support for those standards into emerging open source projects. You can also see open source being used more offensively. And in this case, the idea would be a place where perhaps as a, a, um, you don't have a strong foothold. You don't really have a product in that space. And what you can then do is open an open source alternative to whatever uh, your competitor says, say has in that space and try to commoditize it. But maybe in a more positive light, the way to look at this is if you think of um, how multiple different vendors can all cooperate on um, some shared software. And instead of each one of them taking the time and effort to develop it themselves, to cooperate and create a common and shared instance of that that they can all benefit from. And, and that's really a, a big benefit and big power of open source. Okay, now looking at the traditional standards process, as I said, it's worked quite well for us for a number of years. For those of you who may not be as familiar with it though, just quickly to outline, the idea is that multiple different vendors and, and customers, people who are interested in something, they come together and it could take a number of years to reach some consensus and, and to define a standard. But now once you have the standard, then you need to add support for it into your products and solutions. And that could take a couple more years. 
now these products and solutions start shipping. But uh, just because one vendor implemented that standard and another implemented that doesn't mean they're going to necessarily interoperate from day one because there's a lot of complexity defined in these standards. So then it takes a couple more years now eventually to, to reach interoperable solutions. Now, eventually things do interoperate, which is great. And we've benefited from that, but, but this just takes a lot of time, right? And you don't always have that much time, especially the way things are moving today. And then when you look at open source, what we've seen is the ability to innovate at a tremendously rapid pace, uh, to really leverage a vast community of people working together on, on a, a common problem, and uh, to, to really transform an industry, sometimes much faster than the standards can keep up. When that happens, there's actually the, the possibility of open source software emerging as sort of a de facto standard and uh, coming out before there are any standards and therefore becoming sort of a standard itself just due to its own widespread adoption. And I list some important uh, open source projects in the networking space there from the Linux Foundation primarily uh, on the right hand side. So it's certainly the case that, that open source can be very powerful and very beneficial, but there are some problems and some complexities with open source. When you, if you've looked at using any open source software, you've probably found there's, there's some assembly acquired. It's not like you can just uh, install it and everything works out of the box. As the user, you take on some of the responsibility of figuring out how to deploy the software, how to configure it, how to upgrade it, how to make things continue to work over time. The documentation may not be very good because it's kind of a community effort. And what developer wants to spend time on documentation when they can be adding new features and writing new code instead? Um, sometimes the projects just fade away. There may not be, a, it may start out very promising, but there's not enough backing around it and the community just dissolves. Uh, and it, then even in the good case where there are very strong, well-established open source projects that work very well, it's, it's never really the case that any one open source project will do everything you need for it to do. What the, the end solution that you have, what you're going to have to do is take multiple different open source projects and maybe some proprietary software as well and combine that and integrate it together to form your solution, right? So there's, there's that responsibility that you take on as well. So really the idea here then is to bring those two together because we see a lot of benefits from standards and a lot of benefits from open source and they each have their weaknesses. But if we can combine them in a way that we get something better than just using the two of them separately. We wanna bring the speed and collaborative spirit of open source into the standards world. And we want to get that stability, that concreteness, that exactness that we get out of the standards and lend that into the open source community. Ways we can do that, ways that we can do this is by adding support for key standards into open source projects and also creating code that goes along with the standard so that from a development point of view, you really speed up the time to adoption. Instead of just having a written standard, you have some code that you can use to implement the standard or to jumpstart your implementation and adding of support of that standard in, into your product or into your open source project. And there we can really, you know, kind of get a multiplying factor. I used addition here, but it's really, that they multiply the benefits of each other. So just as an example of this, how many of you are at all familiar with Open Daylight? It's a few out there. It's an open source SDN controller you don't actually need to be that deeply uh, aware of it or, or, or know its uh, uses in order to, to follow the analogy here or the example I want to make. Looking at this, um, there's a lot of, this is sort of a block diagram of, of open daylight. And in the middle, the, you see a lot of the core networking functionality that you need of a network controller. Then there's an abstraction layer. And on the southbound side, there's plugins to uh, kind of interface with any network equipment that's out there. Plugins to support pretty much every networking protocol that's been defined. And then on the northbound side, you have APIs on which you can, on top of which you can write applications. So now what I'm going to do is showing green all the places that 
are directly implementing and adding support for just IETF standards. And you can see it's all over the place, actually. Completely top to bottom, there's support for standards throughout Open Daylight. Now, what this means then is Open Daylight can be used very easily by, say, a service provider who already has a lot of network equipment that supports these, these key um, networking standards that have been in place over the years. Right? It makes, them much, makes it much easier for them to adopt and start using Open Daylight than if it was trying to just go on its own and to find its own ways of doing networking. So this way, the open source community really benefits because uh, their project can be used. And also, the standards community benefits because this open source project supports those key standards and continues to make those key standards valuable. Okay, I've mentioned IETF, and I want to just look a little bit more closely at how within the IETF, um, open source is, is providing a, a positive influence, and how software in general is providing a, a, a positive influence. So IETF, probably more of you have heard of IETF, right? How many show of hands have heard of IETF? The Internet Engineering Task Force. You benefit from the work done by this group every day when you're using the internet. That's where all the key protocols on which the internet runs have been defined. And now continues, the IETF continues to define new protocols to make the internet work better and evolve with us as our, our needs change over time. Key protocols like TCP IP that I'm sure you use, DNS, uh, HTTP when you're making any kind of web request, all defined within the IETF. Also, newer networking protocols like NetConf and RESTConf and Yang, also defined in the IETF. Uh, there's a great talk going on next door on, on QUIC, uh, defined in the IETF. So, um, uh, really a lot of great key networking standards defined. The challenge, though, is that it's, it can sometimes be a slow process defining those. And if you look at the IETF community, as time goes on, that community is sort of aging, and there's not a lot of new people uh, coming into that community, at least not, not at the need that uh, would really be uh, beneficial. You start to see the pace of uh, open source projects and sometimes uh, kind of overrunning work being done within the IETF, so that those open source projects come out with something before the standards can be fully defined, right? And that's so we don't get that best case scenario where we're able to leverage each other. Oops. Um, so the goal then is to move, well, I would say in the IETF, perhaps a little bit too much time was placed on just the standards development process and that definition of, of achieving rough consensus. We want to do is place more emphasis on code and use open source software to help facilitate that. So with the IETF hackathons, that was really the idea, to place more emphasis on running code, to try to advance the pace and relevance of, of IETF standards by having them develop faster, by having them develop better, because you're implementing them at the same time that you're defining them. And you take what you learn and you bring that back into the standards process. We want to attract new people and developers into the IETF by letting them work on something that is exciting to them, code, as opposed to just reading a spec or using email to comment on a specification. And they're very collaborative events. Sometimes you think of hackathons as being competitive, but these are very collaborative and people working on a kind of a joint effort of making the internet work better and all of its key protocols work better. And you can see in the graph here on the right-hand side, the tremendous growth in participation in the hackathon. The first one was about four years ago, and we had 45 people. And it just touched on a few projects in the IETF. Now this last one, we had over 400 participants and touching just about every single um, project or working group within the IETF. I can see the IETF embracing the use of, or, or going more to where developers are. And one example of this is using GitHub. And GitHub is a great place for sharing code, great way for sharing code. So we have a GitHub organization for the hackathon. We use that for sharing code, but also for sharing our presentations and results of what came out of the hackathon. 
So going to where the, the developers are and engaging with them in a way that they're very comfortable with. Also, even for the definition of internet drafts, uh, in addition to continuing to use the internal tools within IETF, like the data tracker that we've always used and mailing lists and whatnot, now there's this ability to use GitHub for that as well, to collaborate on internet drafts. Again, lowering the barriers and kind of encouraging developers to get involved in the standards process. And then over the next two days here, another example of a hackathon. This is the hackathon at AIS. And this is sort of a, a bringing the IETF technology here locally to an important conference you know, within the African region to help uh, compensate for the fact that it can be difficult from people here to travel. It's expensive and takes time to travel to say an IETF meeting and participate in an IETF hackathon. So here you can see that we're um, building out technical capacity uh, around networking standards here within the African community. And we have five projects which are very closely related to IETF technologies, which you can see here, that we'll be working on over the next couple of days, uh, really to raise more awareness of the standards and to encourage contribution back into the standards by implementing the standards, using the standards, and then feeding that back into the IETF and the standards process. So then what I'd really like to do is uh, I encourage you and hope that you will become a, a champion for this combination of open source and standards like I am, uh, with the goals being that we want to make um, standards more consumable by developers, so they'll actually go ahead and use them and deploy them, and make open source more deployable by industry uh, by adding support for key standards into them so that it makes it easier for the for industry to develop and, and adopt and use these, these key open source projects that are being defined. Uh, with that, I thank you very much for your time and open it up for any questions. Any, any questions? We can now combine any questions for the last uh, two presentations. Anybody who has questions? Hey. Okay.